This week's lecture is going to cover perception. It's a pretty fun, interactive topic to cover. I've got a bunch of links to uh, different videos on the, uh, the Reddit link, and uh, so please only click on the links as, uh, as I name them and refer to them uh, throughout the lecture. So uh, one thing that's kind of fun to cover, just a little bit of like pop psych stuff regarding perception, uh, is the notion of illusion. Um, this kind of uh, optical illusion where uh, we have these kind of false or misleading perceptions um, that uh, kind of help us uh, to study the different processes of, of perception. You know, we can show somebody a picture such as this and ask them which line seems to be longer. Um, and to most people, just without knowing any of the tricks or what the right answer must be and, and whatnot, we'll look at this and say, oh, it must be the, the vertical line. Um, because it simply looks longer, but really it's the horizontal line that, if you took a ruler to it, would measure to be longer than the, uh, the vertical line. Um, so again, we use these different illusions to try to make sense of, uh, of how we perceive the world. Um, another illusion, a well-known one um, regarding putting different angles on top of a line can make uh, lines appear um, taller, shorter, and, uh, and whatnot. Of course, the two lines are of equal length. So when it comes to perception, uh, we we use it to essentially make sense of vague uh, sensory material. So when we look at a picture like this, can you see the cow? Bunch of black splotches on kind of a white background with some gray shading, sort of. Uh, I'll give you a second just to kind of look it over. If you want, feel free to pause the video. All we need to do, though, is to insert a bit of an outline, and all of a sudden, we can see the cow pretty clearly. And using perceptual organization, we can take this ambiguous information and kind of make sense of it. Again, to go back, there's the cow without the bit of organization, just a single uh, thin little black line kind of drawn throughout uh, the uh, surrounding pieces that form a cow and then we can see it suddenly uh, a bit more clearly. That's essentially what perception does, is it takes the sensory information in and actually begins to make sense of it, begins to organize it so that our brain can uh, understand what's going on in the environment around us. And people use it for a variety of different reasons. Of course, uh, uh, most well known is in marketing, uh, when it comes to forming logos and uh, for business cards and to go on the sides of trucks and to go on uh, various products that are sold. People want to be able to communicate uh, different ideas and uh, recognizable logos that, that mean quite a bit but use perhaps very little in its um, uh, design. So looking at a picture like this, uh, one may guess that this is a home repair company because we have the picture of a wrench and just by turning it in such a, a way it forms the shape of a house. Here's a really simple image that communicates quite a lot. You can imagine a, a you know a, a company name and a phone number being on there, and that's all you need. If you need home repair, you call this company at this phone number. Really quick and easy way to communicate a lot. And again, it's our perception that is making sense of this uh, of this image. Uh, our ability to take the sensory information to make sense of it. Another example. This pops up on on Reddit from time to time. Uh, it's uh, I don't believe it belongs to an actual golf club, but it's a, a creative design here using uh, uh, both ideas of Spartans having uh, a, a picture that looks like a, uh, a Spartan warrior uh, in a profile position of his head, uh, as well as a, a clear image of a golfer in, in kind of a swinging motion. Uh, again, we can take kind of one image and communicate two different things based on how creative we can manipulate the information and thankfully our brain is able to make sense of this and kind of form this like aha moment of oh I get this and that looks pretty cool. Something else that uh, that many people are familiar with but still I, I find uh, a whole lot of people aren't. Um, I wasn't aware of this until just uh, a few years ago in fact. Uh, the FedEx logo, a lot of people don't realize that there's a hidden image in the FedEx logo. Um, it, even myself, again, just a few years ago, just thought it was a uh, colorful kind of text and, and, you know, pretty bold and simple. Uh, but inside, of course, there is a little arrow. And for a company that ships packages all around the world, movement and direction is very important to this company to communicate. So inside the logo of FedEx is a subtle arrow that uh, a lot of people don't initially see as the uh, the letters 
kind of stand out a pretty strongly um, with the uh, because they're they're um, they exist in more of a positive space, whereas the the arrow exists more in a negative space. And we'll talk about uh, why this happens and why we um, kind of get fooled into not seeing some of it and and almost have to do a little bit of work to to pick out the um, the the subtleties of some of these logos. So perception involves three basic processes: that's selection, organization, and interpretation. I'll be covering each of these with uh, some examples and a little bit more depth in the course of this lecture. Regarding selection, this is essentially choosing where to direct your attention. You're having all this sensory information coming in and your, your brain needs to be able to understand where should I be paying attention? What should I be paying attention to? And where should I, should I be devoting all of my mental resources to understanding? You think about looking in a busy room, you're going to have furniture, a, a lamp on perhaps, you could have uh, another person sitting nearby, a TV on. I mean, there's a lot of sensory information to, to see and to hear, to smell, to touch if you're sitting down or touching something. So your brain has to be able to kind of uh, select what it's paying attention to. One of the ways it does so is through selective attention. This is when you filter out and attend to only important sensory images at the most basic level that you can say this is sensory stimuli I'm not going to pay attention to because I my brain pretty much immediately deems it unimportant for uh, making sense of the environment in its current situation. Um, another uh, interesting part of selective attention is change blindness and I have some video examples that kind of highlight some uh, bits of change blindness. Um, Go ahead right now, if you could, and click on the link that says Door Study. After you click on that video, there's a, a link that says Change Blindness, and I'd like for you to click on that and check out some of the, uh, the links on that web page. And uh, essentially on the Door Study, it's a brief video that highlights uh, an interesting example where people kind of get fooled into uh, uh, not realizing they're talking to two different people. And with the Change Blindness, uh, it's kind of a quick before and after, like what's different in the two images uh, kind of exercise. So go ahead and, and watch the video and participate in the other piece and see if you can tell the difference on, on the change blindness activity of uh, what when you see the flash, what's changing in the images and in, in the various links. I'll go ahead and I'll just put a little silent pause right here. Okay, so hopefully by now you've completed both of those activities. Next up, I want you to click on the, the link that says basketballs. Uh, when you go to click on that link, I want you to, uh, to follow the instructions. A lot of people don't uh, have such a hard time kind of counting the number of passes that, that are made by the players wearing white because there's so much going on in the scene. So really pay attention to that. See if you can pick out the number of passes that occur by the, the team members only wearing white. And I'll go ahead and I'll pause while you go do that right now. Okay, so by now you should have completed watching the uh, video marked basketballs. And uh, of course there's a big reveal that a, uh, a person in a gorilla suit was walking in the background of, uh, of this video as well as somebody leaving the team and the curtain changing color in the background. When, uh, when I first saw this video, uh, well, I saw a similar video uh, several years ago in, in uh, my undergraduate studies. I was in an uh, auditorium with about 200 students watching this and the professor ma gave similar instructions as I just did. Uh, you know, people really have a hard time counting the number of basketballs. You'd be surprised, you know, the number of uh, passes that occur. You'd be surprised how many people get that wrong, so see what you can do. So that kind of spurs a bit of a, a you know, competitive edge of, oh, I'm going to be the one to count this. And so you pay very, very close attention to where the balls are being passed and often miss something that's in plain sight because you're essentially deemed uh, the rest of the environment unimportant. You're trying to ignore other players doing other things and the way they're moving around. You're not paying attention to the background because you're so in intensely focused on it. Um, of course there are going to be some of you who watched these videos and, and perhaps even saw some of the, uh, uh, the changes that occurred, um, but it's absolutely accurate that about half of people missed what uh, uh, missed the gorilla or missed the, uh, uh, the other changing 
information. Again, in that uh, that um, 200 person lecture hall, about half of the people uh, raised their hands as having caught the gorilla. The rest of us, myself included, felt very dumb that <laughs> you're watching this video and a gorilla walks by and what? What gorilla? And it's in plain sight. And they even stop partway through. Anyway, so fun little examples regarding um, selective attention and the effect of change blindness. When we uh, have, because of selective attention, because we're paying attention to certain things in our environment, we necessarily ignore so many other stimuli that are occurring right in front of us. Um, that is essentially the, the purpose of, uh, or what selective attention looks like, I'm sorry, as well as what uh, uh, the phenomenon of change blindness. Feature detectors is another piece of the selection portion of perception. We basically have these specialized neurons in our brain that respond only to certain sensory information. We have neurons that process visual stimuli, we have neurons that process auditory stimuli, and so on. So we only have so much capacity for our brain to process information. So what it's going to be processing at any given time is, is on the one hand, going to be based on what neurons are being fired and, and what kind of stimuli is coming into the brain at that given time. Habituation is another piece. This is our brain's tendency to ignore environmental factors that remain constant. That when you're sitting in uh, the stands watching a football game, you're going to be possibly ignoring the smells of the environment, you may be ignoring uh, the coldness of the uh, seat you're sitting in, you may be ignoring um, somebody texting on their cell phone a few rows in front of you. There's going to be uh, there's going to be generally information that's that naturally, uh, of course they they um, are related to selective attention, but habituation. Uh, just to further clarify, it's it's going to be your brain's tendency to say these things are kind of the same right now and and there's not going to a whole lot of change there's not a whole lot going on so I'm just going to be kind of used to this and say this is probably going to keep being the same um, you'll see yourself kind of snap out of the habituation if uh, you happen to be near a concession stand and they're uh, grilling like hot dogs or, or bratwurst or something and that smell starts to kind of make its way over to you then you start to pick up on the unique smell of that um, but again it, given some time, as the smell continues to uh, to linger, your brain will continue to get used to that and just begin to ignore it and say and start to think that it doesn't even exist. Where somebody could be getting right out of their car, walking up and saying, "Man, those hot dogs smell good, don't they?" And you're thinking, "I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe that was a few minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, but I don't smell it at all." Now, your your brain essentially takes in the sensory information, all that's going on around it, and uh, naturally kind of habituates to it and gets used to it. Organization is when we assemble information into patterns that help us understand the world. Uh, we organize the sensory information in terms of form, constancy, and depth. And I have a, a, a table that um, has some examples and, um, and further clarifies this a little bit. Although uh, this, this table, while generally very good and comes from um, Intro to Psych textbook, uh, figure ground, I did not like their example. So I'm going to put up an example of my own in just a moment. Um, so Figure ground. This is when the ground is always seen as being farther away than the figure. This is one way that we organize things. So here's the example I'm going to use instead. This is a, an infamous example of uh, do you see a white vase or do you see two uh, people in black who are facing each other, kind of profile views of, of each face. Um, figure ground says that if you're focusing on the vase, that the black is seen as the background and generally as being seen as further away. However, if you change your perception and instead focus on the people facing each other, you see the white as background and that being just slightly further away than the two people facing each other. So depending on how you're kind of aligning your uh, perception, how you're organizing things and saying this is a vase or these are two people, However you kind of shift that focus, you're naturally going to be seeing things as having um, some distance, that whatever you're not focusing on is naturally further away, just enough so you can kind of make sense of what's in front of you, when really this is a flat, two-dimensional picture. Proximity is another form of organization. This is essentially that objects that are physically close together are grouped together. So when we look at these different shapes, these blue shapes, we see three groups of six. We don't see 18 separate hearts. 
um, as we're looking at this, they they quite literally they are 18 separate shapes all in um, just just you know in a picture. But we're using organization, our perceptual organizational ability, we can glance at this and say these are three sets of six. This isn't just 18 kind of randomly scattered. And that's helpful for us as we begin to kind of look around uh, uh, the world and try to find um, different groupings of things. And proximity can help with that, of saying that these people together must be kind of grouped together. Um, you're not just seeing things as, as existing individually throughout the world. That can be very, very confusing to the brain. Continuity is when uh, objects continue a pattern, essentially that we see them grouped together. Uh, so in the top figure, when you see this kind of um, interesting little teal-ish blue green uh, shape, um, a lot of people would see the, uh, the square portion uh, mix with this kind of like pyramid or almost like triangle portion mixed together. You typically don't see like little bow ties kind of alternating up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, you're kind of looking for something that, that is more fluid and exists left to right throughout the entire um, uh, throughout the entire image. You're looking for something that's going to make sense throughout the image instead of just clumps of, of random shapes throughout. Closure is the tendency to see a finished unit, uh, like a triangle, a square, or a circle, uh, from an incomplete stimulus. Again, similar to proximity, when you look at uh, an image in closure, you, these are just random angles, uh, different 45 degree angles, or, or uh, 90 degree angles, or even just little curves, and it's your perception that can close them and say, this actually forms a single unit, this is a triangle, this is a square, this is a circle. Um, and lastly, with similarity, similar objects are grouped together, like the uh, the green colored dots are grouped together, and we perceive the number five. That when uh, you know we just color um, uh, different shapes in in a grid in a certain way, like uh, an older style way of uh, illuminating a scoreboard, how it's just this kind of uh, ray of uh, you know field of lights and you can light certain ones up that you're going to start to, to form numbers. You're going to see numbers in them, not just as kind of randomly lit bulbs or randomly colored shapes. Regarding perceptual constancy, this is when we perceive the environment as remaining the same even when uh, there are changes in our sensory input. Um, the four of the best known constancies are, are size, shape, color, and brightness. Uh, something that, uh, as an example for this, when you are uh, walking down a long hallway and, you're, and you see a door in front of you, it's technically growing in size in your visual field. It may start very, very small, but as you walk towards it, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, with perceptual constancy, this is essentially your brain's ability to say, um, on at least one level, that door is still the same. This isn't a bigger door that um, that is you know growing or anything like that, but rather that you're getting close to it. And that's at least uh, um, kind of a size um, constancy example. The Ames room illusion is pretty interesting. There are actually some tourist traps in different parts of the world where uh, you know they claim that you can um, you know grow three times your size or uh, you know things are leaning sideways and how can that exist if gravity exists and all of that when really they just kind of use these different uh, uh, illusions to trick our perceptual ability into thinking that uh, you know something that is um, false is perhaps true so here we have a mother and child um, on the left the child is is way too small to possibly be this mother's child uh, it, there's some kind of there's like a major disconnect in understanding their relationship. And on the right, we have a child that's much bigger than, than his mother. Um, and you can see in, uh, in the corner there, this is how they're able to achieve that trick by sloping the ground up and, and sloping the ceiling down and, and you know kind of playing tricks with the size of the windows and all of that, that when you look into the room, you're, you're not seeing a real room. You're not seeing a, a cubed room you're seeing a, an optical illusion and you can kind of trick your senses into um, uh, you know into fooling your brain. Depth perception is another piece of organization. This is our ability to perceive three-dimensional space and accurately judge distance. 
So uh, you see in this comic here, uh, the man asks the woman, I have no sense of depth perception. Can you tell me, is that someone standing way up there on the corner, or is there a little man in your hair? We see this in, in uh, a lot in comics and, and two-dimensional art, of course, where uh, you know if you want to draw somebody who is much further away, you have to draw them very, very small and give some cues as to, uh, uh, as to creating depth and distance by having lines converge uh, onto uh, kind of a, a similar point in, in uh, you know, what you've drawn as the background. Uh, but if you didn't have depth perception, uh, people and things that were far away would just seem like they're very small and you would not be able to tell um, perhaps how close they were without additional cues. Now an interesting note here is that we see depth perception uh, in, in very, very young children, even in infants, using the uh, visual cliff experiment. This is when we take a checkered tablecloth and, uh, and place the child on top of the table and have uh, a glass covering of the tablecloth extended further away. So the pattern of the, the checkered tablecloth would essentially get smaller by a little bit because of uh, the uh, distance from the infant's eyes. You think about the infant looking down at the tablecloth that he's crawling on, his eyes are just a few inches away from it, but now I'll place this glass in there where the, um, it's the, uh, the tablecloth is several feet from the child, but they have the safety of, of uh, glass to, to look through, but also the crawl on, um, that uh, infants, when they see that, they hesitate to crawl over the glass because they know that the tablecloth is perhaps a little bit further away. They don't know that it's glass in front of them. They just look down and see, whoa, the tablecloth kind of changed now. It looks like it's really far away. Um, infants will typically pause before crawling over uh, to what they think may be their demise. So depth perception involves both binocular and monocular cues. Two, depth, uh, two uh, binocular depth cues include retinal disparity and convergence. And I have some examples on the next slide. Uh, retinal disparity being the separation of your eyes. Uh, this causes different images to fall on each retina. And convergence indicates that a, a, uh, the closer an object is, the more your eyes will converge or turn inward. So you can see this if you take your fingers and put them up to um, your eyes very closely, that as you push your fingers further together or closer, um, I'm sorry, closer together or further apart, you're going to see something uh, very interesting as having like the, the floating finger phenomenon. Um, and this is due to retinal disparity, that your left eye is going to see a different image than your right eye and is thus going to create a, um, a different kind of unique uh, uh, experience of having that floating finger. Uh, and on the far right, the convergence, you can see the, the, uh, the eyes and on uh, something that's very close, they converge, they turn inward toward the nose, and, um, and something that's very far away, they spread out a bit more. And so it's, it's the uh, uh, retinal disparity and convergence that combine to form this notion of depth perception as your eyes come in and, and out, and, uh, and just the idea that you're, you're, each eye uh, provides its own unique image to the brain to process that with these combined, we can tell how far away something is or how close it is to us. Interpretation, the, the third and, and final piece of perception, uh, perceptual organization, this is essentially how the brain explains uh, sensations and it involves three major factors. Perceptual adaptation, which is uh, the brain adapting to changed um, environments. Perceptual set, the readiness to perceive in a particular manner based on expectations. And frame of reference, this is based on the context of the situation. Now, regarding perceptual adaptation, this, this idea here is that as we are moving about in our space and our eyes are moving in different directions as we're moving, um, there's so much information to process that our brain will, will go further than to what our senses can provide and say, this room is basically staying the same. And that um, as we're seeing changes, that doesn't necessarily change what's going on. So when, uh, when you walk into a classroom, for example, and you, you've walked in there several times before, you see the, the, the desks set up in a certain way, always in the same rows and, and whatnot, um, and that's very predictable for you. Imagine the day you come in and perhaps the class before had a different activity going on and they moved the desks all around into a, uh, a different order. 
and it may be a little jarring at first, but you know that this is still your classroom, this is where you've always gone, and that these are still desks for you to sit in, and you can start to still make sense of, uh, of what's going on in, in this uh, room, and this is your ability, your, your brain's ability to um, perform perceptual adaptation, that as things are changing, your brain can adapt and say things still haven't really changed and so I can still interpret this information as uh, um, as being accurate to my notion of this being my classroom of study and that I'm in the right place. Uh, this is similar also to perceptual set. This is kind of your uh, your readiness to perceive in a particular manner. So again when you enter that room you had this idea of what the room should look like in terms of the desk setup. To kind of take the example a little bit further um, you may not typically um, expect there to be um, you know, CPR uh, dummies perhaps in the room. Um, when you walk in and you see like little dummies all over the place that could be very jarring again because you don't think of your psychology classroom as being a place for um, CPR training. And lastly regarding frame of reference that as you enter a, a new or familiar setting that your understanding of it, again, that this is my psychology classroom, uh, your ability to interpret information is is going to be affected. So you're likely going to be seeing uh, pens and pencils as being writing utensils that were used for the purpose of taking notes, perhaps, and maybe not so much as being used for for drawing, um, you know, for an art class or anything like that. There may actually be some art materials in the room, uh, perhaps left by an art student who also takes a psychology course, but again, because you may view it as your psychology classroom, you could see some of those, uh, if, even if they're just, if they're still pencils, but perhaps they're different, uh, different grades, different thickness and whatnot, you still could be trying to make sense of that as like, oh, I wonder if someone just has a unique pencil that they use to take notes in. Um, using that frame of reference, that's how you're going to be able to interpret uh, that visual stimuli and, and regarding its purpose in that room. Now regarding interpretation and, and just really just perception in general, I have a, another uh, interactive piece here. Um, take a moment and read through this story from beginning to end and um, uh, I'll pause a bit and we'll, uh, we'll move on in just a moment. So please go ahead and read um, and pause the video and read. Okay, so for some of you who uh, who read through this, there may have been uh, a bit of kind of an odd moment in, in uh, this passage later on with uh, from the third line from the bottom regarding the word spoon. Um, you know, this, this text in general tells uh, a pretty predictable story, an understandable story, but there's one piece that just kind of stands out a little bit, and that's the, uh, the, the weapon of choice. Now, in cognitive psychology labs, uh, it's, uh, you'll often find uh, something that looks like this. These are cameras that we point at the, uh, the pupils of uh, uh, participants' eyes, and we use it to track what they're looking at. What do they focus on? In, in this example here, you can see there's, it um, uh, looks like that the, the person is like virtually placed perhaps in uh, uh, the uh, driver's seat of a car. Uh, so are they looking at their gauges, the rear view mirror, something out uh, in front of, in the, um, in the windshield? Um, these little cameras will track where your eyes are going and so we can see how much time do you spend looking at these the various aspects of, uh, of the car or you know various stimuli that are placed in front of you. So this is what it might look like uh, if we were um, uh, looking at this text. If you look at the top here you can see like the little circles and the lines and whatnot. Um, this essentially is, is uh, as we understand it when people read they, their eyes actually move in kind of like jumps. Uh, they, they don't go fluid over each word, nor do they read every single word individually. They kind of jump around uh, as you're kind of scanning through it and, and reading it quickly. Um, and so you go to the end of the line and then begin again on the far left, read through that line jumping around, then you jump back to the beginning. Sometimes your eyes don't even go to the very end of the line or the very beginning, um, again just because you, you're, you kind of don't need to. You've uh, picked up that perhaps the burglar, like on the second line, is um, uh, that that you know what that word is without having to go all with casting your eyes all the way to the G, the L, and whatnot. Maybe you saw it in your periphery. You start a new sentence, saw the B, and then the U R G L A R. 
is in your periphery enough that you know that that's the word burglar. And so you bounce back over to crept inside and so on. Now, look towards the bottom here, and this may be, and please ignore that little red arrow. Um, this was <laughs> this is a little difficult to make, but uh, it'll make a little more sense in just a moment. So going towards the bottom here, we would see most people would read just the same, you know, jumping around near the cutting board, weapon in hand. Uh, the burglar uh, lunged at Benjamin, slashing at his shirt with the spoon and tearing. And for a lot of people, they'll read straight over that word spoon and stop at tearing, or maybe it too, or even blood. It's almost like they kind of throw the brakes on their eyes and they kind of, you know, bring it to a stop, but still after the word spoon. They, you know, if, uh, if spoon kind of jumped out at you, is like, this doesn't belong in this context. Um, it was a, there was a cutting board, this is a weapon, this is uh, you know, using it to slash, and then tearing comes right after the word spoon. Uh, this, did I really just read the word spoon? And what we'll see, hopefully it's not too confusing, um, is a whole lot of mess. Um, they'll jump back to spoon and they'll go back to tearing, maybe back to spoon again, they'll go up to slashing, back down to spoon, and can a spoon slash, and wait, it was by the cutting board, let's go up to that, that's where that little red arrow comes into play, uh, reading cutting board, and then back down spoon, so wait, could the spoon have been a slashing weapon near the cutting board, trying to make sense of this, people's eyes dart all around the passage trying to figure out, did I read that correctly, and this all happens in, in just a, a second or two, it could be very quickly, that instead of reading kind of jumping around, uh, you know, every couple of words or so in, in, in reading through the passage, um, many of you may have been reading through this and gotten to the word spoon and done something exactly like this, whether you knew it or not, kind of jumping around and trying to put it back into context and how you're able to make sense of this, and then finally kind of moving on, uh, like with the, the blue arrows, where um, you would jump back to spoon and say, okay, I think I've got it figured out now, it's just kind of a weird... Uh, item to use in this example. Okay, so I guess tearing it to you know, blood-soaked pieces. Um, so this is, is something that we would see in um, in studying cognitive psychology and, and looking at one's perception. Is how uh, how do we make sense of written text? How do we interpret information uh, based on context? Um, you know, as we're reading the different words, we're we're trying to be make things predictable and, as possible, and uh, and you know something that's perhaps written well, it's very predictable, we can read along easily, we're very engrossed in it, we get through it very quickly because it's it's written so well and so um, interesting and whatnot. Um, but when things kind of come up unpredictably, we're going to spend a lot more time kind of bouncing around, rereading passages and checking it out in context and, and uh, we go back to kind of investigating it. We may hop over the words kind of one at a time then instead of jumping around two or three at a time. Lastly, uh, do you notice anything wrong with these photos? Uh, another popular kind of uh, optical illusion. Uh, looking at these photos of Julia Roberts, um, some may view these as, as being probably the same or not having a whole lot wrong with it. But if we just flip them, we find, oh my goodness, that uh, we have a, a typical regular picture of Julia Roberts on the left and uh, an image of her on the right where her eyes and mouth were turned upside down. The idea here, um, think about how this might be related to perceptual set and how you may expect to, uh, to see Julia Roberts and what the, how that was related to the prior image, looking at her upside down. But in fact, on the one picture on the left here, her eyes and her uh, smile is right side up. So something to consider. Now, I have a few more links on the, uh, the, the Reddit page. Um, I would like for, for you to, uh, to watch each of those because I think they're very fascinating. Um, one is the McGurk effect. This is uh, the, an effect where you look at a short video of somebody making a sound, and uh, by watching it, you may be hearing da, da, da because of the way the, the person's mouth is moving. It may sound, you may absolutely swear up and down, sounds like da, 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 but close your eyes then as you're listening to it and see if you can hear him making a different sound. We call this the McGurk effect, that when our eyes take in information and, uh, and it conflicts with our ears, um, I and mean, it could be any, any pairs of senses, that there, there is often going to be a kind of dominating uh, sense, even if, uh, 
uh, if it's especially close, like da and ba being very close sounds to one another, that um, uh, that we're going to kind of rely on one of the more dominant senses, and um, and that's going to actually kind of trick our um, uh, our other sense, or in this um, in this case, our sense of audition to uh, into hearing something that's not really there. Next is a video on priming, and uh, uh, I think it's just a fascinating video, uh, kind of considering uh, you know what you could do in a job interview perhaps handing a nice warm cup of coffee to your job interviewer for just a, a moment while you tie your shoe uh, what are some of the effects that that could have on the interview uh, versus a, a cold soft drink um, and lastly I think one of the more uh, most interesting videos I love this program Nova Science Now um, this is uh, uh, David Eagleman's work on uh, perception and uh, 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 synesthesia and just think about uh, what your own prediction may be that when you're falling when you're perhaps in, in a moment of danger and it seems like time is slowing down is time really slowing down and are we gaining any kind of uh, you know superhuman abilities that we can uh, see and perceive things much more uh, uh, realistic I'm sorry much more quickly, much more accurately, in kind of a slowed down manner, or is it just kind of another uh, illusion that's tricking our senses? So those last three videos, McGurk, Priming, and uh, Nova Science Now, go ahead and watch those, and uh, leave some feedback on the uh, the discussion of this week's lecture. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about, uh, about each of these videos and some of the uh, more interactive pieces of this lecture. That's all for this week. So thanks very much, and I will see you around next time.